I'm very sure that you have an interest in learning the law. That's why you have decided to click this video and see exactly what we are talking about. Now, this is an introduction to South African law. It is a course that promises to cover a lot for you. If you have an interest in the workings of the law, considering that the law touches your lives on a daily basis, yes, you have not made a mistake. You've come to the right place. Feel free to just listen. Give a comment if you need to. If you feel there are any questions that you need to ask, just feel free to ask them. Now, the first question that I would like you and me to think about is why we study, why we need to know the law, why we study the law in the first place. Right? The law touches our lives on a daily basis, and we need to, law, to know the law in order to assess our rights. You know, our daily interactions with other people are based on legally relevant relationships. So for that reason, it is always important for you to study the law so that you may have an insight into how your daily uh, dealings and your relationships with other people are affected by the law. What are the legal implications of your daily decisions and your daily actions? Now, as somebody living in South Africa or somebody who may have an interest in South African law, it is very important for you to understand the historical developments leading to the, uh, to, to, to the South African law as it stands today. So we are looking at the topic, South African law, a historical perspective taking into account that law is a social science. Now, you find that the law serves society in a number of ways. Law has a social origin. It originates in the society. And it is designed to meet the needs of that particular society. So whenever you are looking at the history, I mean, at the law of a particular society, it will always be significant for you to look at the history of that society. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, understanding the history of the law is essential because legal history facilitates our understanding of the law and the future trends that it might take in its developmental path. Um, I'm sure you will agree with me that since we have already at, um, submitted above that the law is designed to deal with issues and problems in a particular society. The, the history of that society, therefore, becomes very relevant in our understanding of that law. So we always ask ourselves what episodes of history have marked the development of uh, the law, particularly the South African law. <clears throat> Now, South African law is very complex. It has a very complex history. Um, you will agree with me that uh, South Africa is a multiracial society, multi-ethnic society. There are people who have different backgrounds. So the, that diversity in history is also reflected in the South African law. Uh, for instance, you find that uh, some of the prominent episodes in the history of the South African law have to go to do with uh, the Roman legal system, which is a system that was established uh, about 700 years before uh, Christ in Rome. And then it developed, and then at some point we had the development of the, the Roman Dutch system, which we will talk about briefly. And then the English law has also had significant influence on South African law. And not to forget that we've got African customary law as uh, the laws of uh, the indigenous South African groups that we have in this country. There is also an element of religious law in the form of, uh, you know, Islamic law. 
So when you look at the map of South Africa as we see it there, you find that different areas may have been impacted differently by the impact of, uh, I mean, by the development of, of South African law. Now, one of other question that we always need to ask ourselves is where do we find the law when we need to find the law? For instance, if one is faced with a legal question, where do you seek answers to that uh, legal question? If two people are having a dispute, where do you find the answers? To how do, where, where do you, what sources do you consult or what material do you consult? in order to establish exactly what the legal position is. Now, we have what we call sources of law. Uh, these are the material uh, that we consult in order to find out the particular principles of law regarding a specific legal question that stands to be resolved. And uh, as it shall turn out, there are many sources of law in South Africa. We distinguish uh, authoritative sources from persuasive sources, but this shall, this shall become clear as we proceed. Now, as we have just mentioned, we need to distinguish sources of law from origins of law. When we talk about origins of law, we are referring to the historical background of the legal system. That's the history of the legal system. And meanwhile, when we talk about uh, uh, the, the sources of law, we are concerned with the material which one has to consult in order to find out what the law is or just to find out the legal position in respect of a particular legal question. So here we are talking about the material that one has to consult. That's what we mean by uh, the sources of law. As we have already uh, mentioned above, we distinguish between authoritative sources from persuasive sources. Uh, as the names themselves suggest, a source is authoritative when it contains a mandatory principle from which a court is not at liberty to depart. In other words, it is a source that spells out principles in such a way that uh, they answer uh, questions about whether a right has been has materialized or not. An example of such a source is a national constitution. Uh, almost every state has a constitution and uh, it is usually the Supreme Court of that land, uh, you know, such that you cannot or the courts are not free to formulate or apply any principles that are outside uh, what uh, the national constitution spells out. Meanwhile, a persuasive source is one which, is, which contains a principle that a court may, you know, apply. It is kind of a guiding principle. It doesn't have that uh, punch or that authority. But courts are at liberty sometimes to deviate from that source. They frequently apply it uh, as they try to maybe answer a question where in connection with uh, maybe where there is no clear and uh, straightforward authoritative source dealing with that uh, problem or that question. Now, we continue to look at the sources of uh, South Africa's law. Uh, the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa of 1996, right? Uh, there, if you read there, it says Act 108 of 1996. When the Constitution was adopted for the first time, it was Act, it was adopted as Act 108 of 1996. 
but that citation has been dropped ever since because as a constitution as in the supreme court of the law of the land it is inappropriate to still continue to refer to the south african constitution as an act of parliament now therefore the constitution is the supreme um, law of the republic of south africa um, or for that net uh, for that matter depending on how it is crafted it is the supreme court uh, for instance in zimbabwe we there is a similar clause to say that the constitution of 2013 amendment number 20 is uh, the supreme court of i mean the supreme law of that land and there are also statutes or acts of parliament which are, which are very significant uh, authoritative sources and then we have these uh, common law principles or the roman dutch principles as uh, you know developed uh, in, in in first in rome then applied in in the dutch or in the netherlands before uh, its importation or rather before yes it, it was brought into south africa when jan van Riebeck and the other people arrived in 1652 and then we have uh, the the writings of uh, authorities those ancient authorities um the, we have a lot of those uh, who have written about the, especially the roman dutch principles of law there are court judgments also on substan substantially similar cases uh, through the principle of stare decisis or the binding precedents uh, the judgments of South African courts are very, very significant. They are a very significant uh, authoritative source. And so is customary law or the law applied in the different uh, indig indigenous communities of South Africa. Then there's also the issue of foreign law because that one tends to be more persuasive, uh, but it can be applied where appropriate. Uh, courts actually south african courts receive a lot of guidance from foreign courts and the constitution of south africa itself uh, makes it very very mandatory that the courts in the interpretation of the law should sometimes refer to court or foreign law and then we have international law also as a very important uh, source of law whilst we have textbooks and academic journals which are not necessarily authoritative but they have that persuasive function now that brings us to the question what material would one consult in order to find south african law on human rights if you had to find the law regarding the rights of married persons, which merit material sources would you consult? And what source does one consult in order to find the law regarding the international law on environmental protection? Think about these sources. Uh, brainstorm about them. We, the first one we mentioned was uh, the human rights. South African law on human rights. The constitution is a very important source to be with. What about the rights of married women? I mean, married persons. We are talking here about, you know, the Civil Marriages Act and other related sources of law. And then environmental, international environmental law, necessary international conventions dealing with uh, that kind of an issue would be very relevant uh, in connection with that. Now, what about the structure of the South African court system? Uh, the system of justice is administered by numerous courts, which can be classified as superior courts, the high courts, the lower courts. And we also have some traditional courts um, which also do play a very significant role uh, but basically the, the the courts that we have cover up, you know fall within the 
the three broad categories that we have mentioned today. Um, if you take a closer look at uh, this structure, it is still an illustration of uh, those courts that we have in South Africa. It's a kind of an organogram, which gives us, gives us a, a picture of uh, how they relate with one another, the inferior courts or the lower courts, obviously, uh, referring matters to the senior courts and uh, you know, superior courts rather than senior courts, with the Constitutional Court uh, of South Africa being the highest court in all matters to do with the Constitution, whilst the Supreme Court of Appeal uh, has exercised juris its jurisdiction in connection with all other matters, except, of course, constitutional matters where the Supreme Court of Appeal, I mean, where the Constitutional Court has exclusive jurisdiction. Then uh, the High Courts of South Africa, they exercise original uh, jurisdiction in respect of uh, quite a number of matters. And unlike the Magistrates Courts, which are lower and which are sometimes and often referred to as creatures of the state, because they are creatures of statute rather, because they are created in terms of statutes but uh, a, a closer look at uh, this organogram will reveal exactly how these courts fit one another okay. and then still on the same matter this is a, a summary the superior courts the constitutional court it deals with constitutional matters. The Supreme Court of Appeal, it deals with all matters. Uh, in a, it is an appellate division, actually, on all matters, all matters in South Africa. Then the high courts, they have inherent and unlimited jurisdiction to hear all cases, and their jurisdiction is limited to a specific geographical area, you will notice that South Africa has, South African high courts uh, have exercised jurisdiction in terms of, uh, rather in respect of some geographical limitations, almost in line with the former divisions that uh, the country was divided into. Uh, you would have your, your previous, uh, or rather erstwhile uh, Transvaal courts, and the high courts there, you would have your Natal high courts there, you will have your northern provinces high courts, you will have your, you know, Free State, the Eastern Cape, the Western Cape. So those are the divisions. Then the lower courts or the magistrates' courts have limited jurisdiction as compared to the superior courts, with certain courts falling outside. Um, their jurisdiction with set or rather certain matters. Um, for instance, uh, we are saying that they have limitations in terms of uh, the matter, the scope, the, the scope and the matter they, that they may entertain. And then they also have limitations to do with uh, what we may call the penal, yes, the penal jurisdiction. Uh, if it's civil matters, they may not hang you you know, matters where a certain threshold, uh, you know, in terms of uh, if, whether it's the amount of money a settlement or it's a, a punishment or a fine, there is a limit in, in term, they are limited by the amounts of money that they are able to, you know, deal with in terms of cases. Now, let us explain the word, the word jurisdiction. What is jurisdiction? What does the term jurisdiction mean? It's the capacity of a court to hear a case and pass a valid judgment. It's the capaci this capacity may be relative to the type of matter that a particular court is competent to hear, e.g. the validity of a heel, of a will, sorry. A magistrate's court lacks jurisdiction to hear a matter on the validity of a, a, a will whilst uh, the High Court has inherent jurisdiction 
to hear those kind of matters. And as we have already mentioned above, sometimes uh, the jurisdictions of courts are limited by a geographical area, uh, you know, regarding the matter, the place where the matter at hand took place. For instance, we've got Pochefstrum uh, as a geographical area and it has jurisdiction or competence to hear and entertain matters happening within that geographical area. Still looking at the courts and their structure and that hierarchy, there is a very important principle known as the stare decisis principle or the principle of binding precedence. Here we refer to the fact that every court is bound by the decision of the superior court within its area of jurisdiction if that jurisdiction is not based on an obvious error. In other words, when a superior um, court within that geographical area makes or any right, it, it, it passes a certain judgment uh, based on a certain reasoning and, you know, decision, the lower courts within that jurisdiction are bound by the principle that is expounded by the superior court. While it is not the duty of uh, the courts to make the law, but only to interpret and apply it, the decisions that uh, superior courts reach do have the effect of a new law sometimes. Well, this issue of um, judicial activism, maybe it's beyond the scope of uh, this discussion, but uh, we are saying that the courts do apply the law and sometimes they, in the exercise of discretion, they expound new principles previously unknown sometimes. Now, in the course of a trial, courts must refer to decided cases dealing with the substantially similar matters to those they are dealing with. I think uh, this uh, principle, that is, uh, this bulleted point in, in red ink, the red uh, color there, uh, summarizes exactly what we mean by, you know, this principle of stare decisis. It says, in the course, in the course of a trial, courts must refer to decided cases that deal with substantially similar matter to those they are handling at the current moment. Now, that then brings us to aspects of judgment. Uh, an important aspect of a court judgment, uh, or rather important aspects of a court judgment, include uh, the following. We have uh, a title there, of the, I mean, in terms of the the two parties involved in a dispute. In our example here with the National Soccer Brewers versus the Cop Capital Bank Limited in 2006. Now, National Soccer Brewers is an applicant or a claimant or an appellant as the case may be. A v refers to versus as against. Then Cop, Cop Capital Bank Limited is a defendant or respondent against whom the case was brought. 2006 is the year in which the matter was reported. Uh, remember, we have, uh, you know, these law books, these uh, records of cases, the case books, which are, you know, this is a, a register of courts, I mean, of reportable cases, all ca uh, court cases that have been heard. Uh, in the high courts, in the supreme courts, and you know, important cases, they are reported. So each year we have these divisions and uh, we have these reports rather, and each uh, case that is reported has this kind of an index in the system. This is six there represents the sixth part of the reports, and then 208 is the page in which the case is reported and the matter was heard by the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloom for 10 or Mangao. Now, these are the aspects of a court judgment. So whenever you are faced with, uh, when you are reading a court judgment, you must take note of uh, 
this kind of citation because this exactly uh, spells out for you uh, in which uh, book or which uh, rec records you can find uh, the reports on that particular case as well as who were the parties involved as and uh, you know the court that had or entertained uh, that a case or decided on that case Now, in giving a decision, there are certain pro uh, court pronouncements that come out. Uh, we have spoken about uh, the stare decisis principle and uh, the principle of a binding precedent. In the case of a binding decision, there are two important kinds of pronouncements that the court makes. One is called a ratio decidendi, and the other one is called an obita dictum. Now, the ratio decidendi is the part of the decision that refers to the reason for the decision, and it is binding to the lower courts within the hierarchy. In other words, having entertained all the arguments and all the evidence and all the facts before it, the court makes a decision. So it is that reason for the decision which then is recorded or viewed as the ratio decidendi and it is the part of a court ca uh, case or rather the, po the court uh, uh, decision it is the part that is uh, binding on the other future decisions may, whether within the, that hierarchy or uh, to the lower courts and then the obiter dictum, on the other hand, refers to a statement made by the court in passing. In other words, as the court entertains uh, arguments and uh, evidence, you know, propositions and submissions brought before it, it may consider them and then it may even make hypothetical uh, you know pronouncements to say if things stood if this evidence or if things stood in a particular way matters could have come out this way or that way so uh, that uh, you know speculative you know interpretation of uh, or the facts before it as the court decides exactly what is uh, the best outcome or the best decision to make that statement which is called which it makes in passing which has persuasive value in respect of uh, future decision it is called an obiter dictum it is made in reference to an alternative argument so whilst a ratio decidendi is uh, uh, the reason for the decision, an obiter dictum is a statement made as an incidental remark, so to speak. I think that's the, the best way to put it. It's an incidental remark. Now then comes the question, the Africanization of South African law. Uh, recently, you know, I would say from about 1990, when 1994, when we had the new dispensation in South Africa, uh, the principle of Ubuntu has been proposed as an alternative philosophy to looking at uh, legal issues. Uh, it is, you know, this principle has... Uh, caught the attention of quite a number of uh, senior court uh, judges as well as academics. Yvonne Mohoro, for instance, uh, one of the prominent judges, has written about this principle 
expounding on exactly what the principle or concept of Ubuntu is. Uh, it is a principle that is derived or best expressed by the African, or uh, yeah, this Nguni statement or proverb, or maxim, which means a person derives his humanity from his membership of a community or, you know, relationship with other people. Now, in looking at uh, the development of South African law, one question that arises is, how relevant is the concept of Ubuntu in light of the assertion that it attaches weight to values such as human dignity, group solidarity, conformity, respect, justice, good faith, fairness, and other similar virtues? Well, uh, discussion of the concept of Ubuntu itself uh, would occupy us in another day, but in the meantime, just take note that it emphasizes group, un group uh, human dignity, group sol solidarity, and conformity. In other words, uh, whilst the Western principles of law tend to favor, you know, winner take all kind of uh, solutions in dispute resolutions. Um, the issue of group solidarity and common good is actually elevated to a principle of uh, operation in, in respect of Ubuntu. So then our question is, how far is this principle, or how relevant is this principle going to shape the development of the law in South Africa? This would help us to identify the leading South African court cases that have expounded uh, widely on the meaning of this concept. Uh, what comes to mind here is the Afro Forum case, where there was a dispute between Afro Forum and Julius Malema. You can look it up, and it's a very interesting read where this principle of Ubuntu was expounded by the court. And the question is, how can Ubuntu concept be applied in seeking solutions to commercial disputes? Uh, can these principles of human dignity, group solidarity, conformity, as well as respect and justice be applicable to, you know, commercial disputes? Just think about it and think of scenarios where you think this might be applicable. With these principles, we've come to the end of our discussion. I hope you found uh, this uh, discussion fruitful. Thank you very much for participating in it. I wish you good luck in your studies. Bye-bye.